Christina Wood, and I'm a board certified music therapist. I work primarily here at Mayo in pediatrics, serving general pediatric patients, as well as patients in the PICU and cardiac um, and peds rehab area. And I also have a small private practice in the community. I'm Jenny Cruz, when you can hear me okay. Um, I also am living, live here in Rochester. I have my own business, and I'm currently working primarily with children and adults with developmental disabilities uh, using neurologic music therapy. Um, and in the past, I have worked in hospital settings and hospice settings as well. So our goal today is to help you understand basically, you know, what is neurologic music therapy and how can it help patients reach functional goals and the basic research that supports it, as well as some of the techniques that we utilize. And just so you kind of know what to expect, we're going to start talking about, you know, what is music therapy and why is it that we do use music and how is it that we use music and then what exactly is neurologic music therapy because it, it is a little different and then how do we use it for the three domains for sensory, motor, cognition, and speech and language skills. So here we have just a very general definition of music therapy. This particular definition is from the American Music Therapy Association, which is our national association. Um, and they state that uh, music therapy is the clinical and evidence-based, now it's very important, clinical and evidence-based. We're not just plugging music into somebody for no reason. This, these are all um, have basis in studies that have been done, lots of them, lots of studies. <laughs> Use of music interventions to accomplish individualized goals within a therapeutic relationship. So um, we're not just applying, like we're not going to just turn on Mozart and call it good. These are very specific functional goals and objectives for each individual that we work with. Um, and music therapists are credentialed, and Christina will talk a little bit more about that. So for some of you that have maybe seen me, um, in the hospital, you typically probably see me. I have my guitar and I have a cart. And one of my sometimes favorite and least favorite questions is, oh, what are you or what are you doing? So um, I always think it's important to help clarify because as professionals um, and people that are in the healthcare industry of knowing, you know, what exactly is music therapy and why would you ever want to make a referral for a patient and why would you even want us working with your patients? Um, so I always like to share that no, we're not music teachers, because sometimes that's a question. We're actually music therapists. We have a minimum of a bachelor's degree in music therapy. And a lot of people are like, well, what, what does that act actually entail? So obviously learning music, and how do we use music in therapy, and how do we use music as therapy? And we're going to talk about that a little bit. Um, and then psychology, a lot of psychology courses through the ages, birth through death, because it's not just in rehab settings that music therapists work. Music therapists work. Um, prenatal, NICU, early intervention, hospice, bereavement, so all through the ages. Um, and then basic science, anatomy, medical terminology things. And just like anyone else, we have practicums that we're doing and followed by an internship lasting at least six months in length and then a board certification exam and continuing education. So I like to say to parents who are asking for referrals, um, and then here we have some comparisons too of, you know, who is it that you're looking for, and why would you ever want to make a referral into the community? And as a consumer, helping parents understand that you would want somebody who's board certified to protect yourself, your family, your child, and for us to protect our patients. So there are different music modalities or practitioners out there, and I want you to know that because we do see some of them um, here at Mayo, and we do have you know lovely spaces like the grand pianos positioned throughout the buildings, and it's great but it is not music therapy. Uh -huh. Or sometimes we have, um, you know, the choirs or the occasional harpist or musician that will come and play in the hallway. And that's great. It's music, but it's not music therapy. So our goal today is to really help you understand that maybe it's a volunteer, maybe it's somebody that has a little bit of training, but what we're talking about is very goal-directed, clinical-based. And just to point out different ways that the healthcare industry does recognize music therapy, the Joint Commission recognizes music therapists as qualified professionals to work in facilities, and uh, CMS recognizes us. Um, there is a Hix-Pix code for music therapy, and there is a, a rehabilitation code, and, well, the ICD-9 is almost outdated now, basically. Uh -huh. But AMT also does 
partner, AMTA being our national association. It does partner with CARF, um, and they're a member of CARF's International Advisory Council, and they also participate in the American Congress of Rehab Medicine. So there's lots of different ways that our national organization is partnering with rehab organizations as well. So now that we've told you a little bit about what music therapy really is, and we'll continue about talking about that, we're going to talk about why we want to utilize music as our therapeutic tool. So now we're taking these um, from the neurologic music therapy standpoint, and we'll talk more specifically about what neurologic music therapy is sort of within the whole realm of music therapy as a profession. But um, these are the four, what we call the four working mechanisms. So essentially with this, as Christina said, we're going to be answering the why question. Why music? Why is it an effective music and therapeutical, therapeutic tool? The first one here um, is rhythmic stimulation and entrainment. Now, everybody got a hand free? finger. All I want you to do is uh, tap to the beat. And stop. Okay. So it's a fairly simple task, hopefully. <laughs> Um, so basically what I want to answer now is the question, what is happening in your brain for that to happen? So basically what your brain hears there is the space between the beats. So it hears a click, 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 and what the brain is processing actually is the time between the beats so that it can anticipate where um, the muscle movement essentially. So, so it can prepare uh, your body and your muscles to move in order to hit that tap right on the next beat. So we call this, this that's called entrainment. Anytime you use an outside timing tool to um, help somebody move. <clears throat> so in this case, uh, the rhythm primes or gets the motor system ready to move in a coordinated in a coordinated way by providing that external timing cue. So in this case, it was just the steady beat. Um, so that structure of that steady beat provides an organized and not only organized but predictable pattern that we can use to control motor timing. And I can see like some wheels are turning. Okay, so now how are we going to use that in a therapeutic way? We'll get to that, I promise. So um, also neurological studies show that this happens subcortically. This isn't something you have to concentrate on to do. And actually some studies that are coming out now actually show the more you concentrate on it, the harder it is to do. You kind of, you're kind of your, your um, frontal lobe kind of gets in the way a little bit. Um, so actually, the sound in general has a strong impact on arousal and priming of the motor system. And specifically, it gets it into a state of readiness through the reticulospinal pathways in the brain stem. So here's a real life example. Any runners in the room? Anybody like to run? Nobody likes, some people like running, okay. And well, most of us have at least taken like a group exercise course at some point in our lives. But if you think about, they always choose music with a strong beat and they coordinate the, the time there. But with runners, like if you're really into a groove with a song, a lot of you, do you listen to music while you run or exercise? So you really get into that groove, right? And all of a sudden the music changes and you're like, whoa, yeah. just kind of fix that timing. There's a little bit of a stutter there while you have to kind of, your body has to re-entrain to the new song or beat essentially. So rhythm goes beyond steady beats, though. If we're talking about music, there's lots of different, obviously, rhythms, and music can, can be very simple. It can be very complex. So here's one other um, game I want you to just play with me. Just follow me. Okay. You're going to need two hands for this one. <laughs> Sorry, a lot of you are eating lunch. Um, so follow me here. Snatch me. There you go. That was very fast. That was very good, very good. Okay, so there are a lot of things actually happening in that very short example. So if we're talking about rhythm, we talk about it as a sort of sensory, an auditory timer that's utilizing the connections between the motor and auditory systems, which in the brain are very close together, like physically close together. So this regulation of movement can also include the dictation of space and position as well as a force cueing. So in that simple example that we were doing, I changed, um, especially at the end when I had you do that accent, 
the tempo stayed the same through those three examples that I had you do. But when you had to do the force cueing, all of a sudden we're going like this. And you had to move your hand out a little farther and come in a little faster in order to hit that beat on time. Does that make sense? So just having that steady beat by changing the patterns, we can also affect the force of movement, the position of hand positions, or basically the position of the body as well, just by changing something as simple as that. So obviously, as you can see kind of where we're going, we utilize this particular mechanism in particular when we're talking about sensory motor objectives and functional outcomes for our patients. So the second working mechanism is pattern information processing. So essentially this is dealing with timing again, and timing is a key component in neural information processing, particularly in regards to how we learn perception and learning in general. So music can provide that timing structure to promote learning, particularly cognition and language, and then as we were just talking about with motor. And the rhythm, or essentially it's the beat, the steady beat, the rhythm was in between. The beat creates the sense of anticipation, or what it is that the brain can learn to anticipate, so we know what's coming. So again, simple examples, but I want you to start thinking. I'm going to grab my guitar here. How did you all learn your ABCs? Your song, okay? So how many of you can say your ABCs, just saying them and not go, in your head, A, B, C, you know, like that. No. It's a little bit harder, okay? Very simple. Obviously, I work with children, so that's the first example I go to, okay? So if we're working with elderly, you are my sunshine, my only. Okay, how did you know that? How many of you were thinking of that song when you came in here this morning? Okay, yeah, probably nobody. Um, or how about... Um, so, not all of us are that old. How about, you and me go. Okay, thank you. Okay. So, how did you know that? You weren't thinking of that song two seconds ago. So, it has to do with the timing and the sequencing. So, it's not just motor, it's cognition and learning and what's embedded. Um, So essentially this has to do with the whole cognitive timing premise versus motor timing, which we were just doing earlier. But that's the main concept that we utilize when working on cognitive goals. Okay, next one. Differential neurological processing. Okay. Okay. So there's a couple of ideas here, and the first one, um, because it, takes, it makes us uh, look a little differently as what we might th uh, think about as music. So if you're just listening to music on the radio, you think of that as kind of a single stimulus that your brain is processing. And actually, I like to think of music as a multi-purpose tool. There's a lot of different aspects to, of, to music that your brain is processing at the same time. So we have the uh, melody, we have harmony, rhythm that I was talking about, tempo, dynamics, uh, that's the loudness and, and or loud or quiet, essentially. Um, time signature that I was doing with the bump, 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 versus the, those two different time signatures, essentially. So there's lots of different pieces of music. As a music therapist, we can pick apart and utilize different um, aspects of music for depending on our, uh, you know, functional goal and objective, and we'll say that over and over today. Um, and also, the brain processes each aspect of these differently and in slightly different areas of the brain. Um, furthermore, there's no one area of the brain that is responsible for processing music. A uh, long time ago now, they were thinking that, you know, music was processed in the right hemisphere and language was in the left. That's not at all true. Um, as I was mentioning, the rhythm is in particular, or the, the steady beat is processed at least partially in the brain stem, um, and it goes throughout the whole brain, and we can, when you were, and I'll show you a slide in a second about this, but uh, when you were processing the increase in tempo, you're like, oh, that's going a little faster. So your frontal lobe got involved there, too, kind of making decisions about, oh, this is a little faster, now I'm noticing that. Um, and furthermore, we also know that therapeutic music training affects the structure and function of brain systems. So here is a, a nice picture of kind of what your brain was just doing during that tapping exercise I had you do. Um, the red is just simply listening or 
is tapping to a steady beat, essentially. So you can see the motor pathways are all lit up as well as the uh, cerebellum for the motor planning and obviously the auditory systems. And then uh, the 20% tapping um, is the green, and that's where they're, they're clicking up the tempo about 20% every time, et cetera. And then you can see in the yellow, they're still tapping, but it's more random. So you can see uh, the different areas of the brain that are involved in going, I don't know what's going on here. <laughs> okay. In this next two slides, just really talk about um, uh, still the differential neurological processing. Music uh, uses the same areas of uh, the brain as these particular systems. So in that they share the same areas of the brain, we can use music to access those areas if they have lesions in those areas. So we can work on motor control, language, uh, perception, and various areas of cognition. And finally, more specifically, um, in optimizing the function, we not only utilize those same areas, but we can also optimize functioning in, there, in those areas as well. So for the motor, we can utilize that entrainment and the priming um, of the motor system that I was talking about. Um, in cognition, we provide cognitive timing, sequencing, patterning, chunking of information, and we'll give you some more specifics on that when we're talking about specific techniques. In the perception, um, attention, various types of attention, um, and arousal, awareness, um, and also language can be a uh, combination of the above because there's motor control involved in language. There's obviously attention and memory involved with language as well as auditory perception. So when you're talking about language, you kind of to tease apart exactly what you're working on, but essentially we use all of these areas. So the final working mechanism that we're going to talk about is the affective and aesthetic response. And essentially, um, Music communicates emotion and meaning in two different ways. So the first is through emotional responses that have become connected to music through an associated learning process. So essentially, your memory or your brain is encoding a memory with each particular song. Every time you hear music, and you don't really, it's not like it's something that you think about, but it, it's happening. Um, I think an easy example is working with veterans or people that have served. Um, this is something that comes up a lot. Uh, there's a, a lot of times really strong emotional ties. So And I'm proud to be an American where at least I know I'm free. And I won't forget the man who died who gave that right to me. And I gladly really short example, memories, thoughts that come to mind, anyone willing to share? I definitely thought about my brother-in-law who's a veteran. Okay, thank you. So a brother-in-law who's a veteran. Anyone else? I, I heard um, uh, it, was at, it was a number of years ago at the uh, Olmstead County Fair and there were some little girls at a talent show and they were dressed in those clothes and they were singing that, but it was obviously very... Um, meaningful to them as well. Okay, so a memory of being at the fair and um, some little girl singing it at a talent show. Again, before that music started, that wasn't something you were thinking about. And we're not going to talk a whole lot about psychosocial <laughs> support, but that's something that, um, as music therapists, we're constantly doing. Um, and it's important that we're trained how to help process these emotional responses that are happening. Because whether or not you know it, um, a song starts playing, and then all of a sudden these emotions are happening. How are you going to process and support that? I was recently working with a father, or sorry, a patient whose father was a veteran. I had no idea this hadn't come out in working together yet, and we were excited about him going home, and so we were doing, I don't know, something silly, a going home song. And I actually think it was Take Me Home Country Roads, tied in with something else. And the father was like, please stop playing that. Okay, can you you know can you tell me more? He's like, well, I'm a veteran, and then he started talking about the memories that were associated with that. So again, being trained and ready to process that. Um, sometimes just playing music, we have to be a little more intentional about things that can come up because of how it's encoded in your brain. A little lighter subject. Sweet Caroline. Bum, bum, bum. <laughs> 
of music that when it's live music we're constantly changing and controlling that as our patients are working on different things we can change what we're doing musically to help with that um, and a simple example but how does that again tie in with affective aesthetic responses think about watching a movie can you imagine watching the movie Titanic without the soundtrack how would you know there's an iceberg <laughs> or you know what about Jaws that da, 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 da. Again, really simple, silly examples, but to just get you to get that idea of what is happening in your brain. How is that, how is music tied with those memories? Motivation. Um, choosing music to work out too, we talked about that, or maybe, I don't know, cleaning your house. You're going to be intentional about, it's probably something, a beat, rock, rap, whatever it might be, versus, I don't know, Enya or Kenny G, something <laughs> that you might relax or rest to. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it would take you all there. I hope you're not cleaning my house. <laughs> so essentially, you can see those are the four working me mechanisms of music that we work with as therapists. So why are we doing what we're doing? Why are we using music? Um, so hopefully that gives you a little bit of information on that. I just I love this quote and wanted to share it with you. The brain that engages in music is changed by engaging in music. So again, getting you to think about what it is that we do, why it is what we do, and now we're going to talk about how we actually do that. Um, so the process that we use, we follow, is called the transformational design model. And essentially what happens is we're getting a referral for music therapy. Um, somebody, it happens in different ways here, but essentially that referral is received, and then I go and I assess the patient, just like anyone else. I meet the patient, I assess, you know, what are their needs? So I'm determining um, what, what are their clinical needs, and then I'm figuring out what goals and objectives we're going to work on in our sessions, just like anyone else. Maybe it's decreased anxiety, like Dr. Wilder, we're doing a study right now on that. But going back to rehab needs, we're, you know, maybe it's increased trunk control or functional um, increasing... Well, we're going to talk about gait later, or reaching across midline, or maybe it's visually tracking. Whatever it is, those goals and objectives, I'm going to figure out how can we use functional goals and exercises to do that. So what is, what is the motion that's needed? Is it reaching, grasping? Is it the arm extension and flexion? Is it crossing midline? And then we're going to determine how do we use music to do that? How are we going to take the tempo, the pitch, the rhythm, everything else, and make it help? to cue that movement or that goal or whatever it is that we're working towards. And then obviously, like anyone else, we want to transfer that um, to a functional real world. I'm not going to go home with them. I'm not here all the time. So how can we use that to transfer to a regular activity? Well, the goal isn't to, we're going to reach, grasp, or an egg shaker. No, but maybe it's, can you reach and grasp around a door handle? Or maybe for a little babe, is it, you know, a little tiny rattle, starting to reach and grasp so we're not having all that tone or whatever it is that we're working on. So we're transferring those music exercises to functional things and then, of course, documenting what we're doing and teaching the family or maybe the nursing staff or whoever, how can you continue to do this while we're not here? So does that make sense kind of about what is the process? You know, we're not just going in, hey, we're going to play music or, hey, I'm your music teacher. It's not that at all. Trying to help you understand what it is that we're doing and why. Okay, now we're going to get into a little bit more specifically about neurologic music therapy. And as in any profession, there are varying schools of thought and the best way to go about doing something. Um, but neurologic music therapy within the field of uh, music therapy in particular is especially um, rigorous 
in that it has um, the largest, I believe, basis of scientific and uh, I said essentially all of the all of the techniques we use have been modeled off of studies that have been done. So neurologic music therapy in particular is based on a neuroscience model of music per perception and production. We're always thinking about how is music processed in the brain, what's going on in the brain, and how is music going to help that. The influence of music on functional changes, we'll say this, again, like I said, we'll say it over and over, but this is key, on um, functional changes in non-musical brain and behavior. So we're not, like Christina said, we're not going in and teaching music. We're working on functional goals and objectives that, that these people need to work on. Um, more specifically, as I was saying, the neurologic music therapy is a research-based system of standardized techniques, uh, and we, use, we divide those into three areas of one sensory motor, speech and language, and cognitive, and we'll give you some specific examples of each of those areas as we move along. <clears throat> um, on the... Oh, we didn't cue that up, but um, on the CBRM, uh, the center, excuse me, the Center for Biomedical Research in Music and Neuro Neurologic Rehabilitation is um, through the Colorado State University where a lot of these techniques in the first studies were done. Um, Dr. Tout, Dr. Michael Tout in um, particular, um, was kind of the driver of a lot of that research and development of these standardized techniques. And he is um, currently... Um, highly involved in the World Federation of Neuro Rehabilitation, the WFNR, um, and actually Neurologic Music Therapy is a special interest group for that organization. I believe he's actually on the board of that as well. Um, so uh, Neurologic Music Therapy is not just an American thing. It's definitely a worldwide phenomenon, though. Um, I think one thing that we're going to mention to you, and it's a lot of people asked me when we started um, thank you. with some neurologic music therapy time on the PEDS rehab unit, because we were always co-treating on the general PEDS floor with the rehab staff working on rehab goals, and now we have some time specifically for the rehab patients. Um, we looked at, at, at billing, and what does that look like? And that's a question that I often get. And so every technique that we talk about or that is standardized does match a CPT code. However, um, we have not chosen to do that here yet, um, but it is possible. There are music therapists and facilities that are out there billing uh, because everything does match a CPT card. So moving on of what it is that we do and why, these are, we're going to give you some examples. Sensory motor training, rhythmic auditory stimulation, um, essentially rhythmic entrainment, which we talked about earlier. So. This uses the concept of rhythmic entrainment, and it can be done often in co-treatment with um, a PT or maybe it's just the music therapist, but essentially it begins with a functional gait assessment. There's no music, so we're looking at, um, there's actually a mathematical problem that you're gonna do if you have to do it properly, um, but that determines the tempo of the beat for the intervention. And then you add the music after the assessment's done, and obviously there's a strong beat that's gonna be incorporated, so you want that beat to match, uh, ideally, the heel strike. Um, and then, once entrainment occurs with the gait and the rhythm, then the therapist can begin manipulating the music, the tempo. Maybe you want it to be a little faster. Maybe you need it slower because what are you working on? Is it stride length? Is it heel strike? Is it speed? Whatever it is. Um, we are going to show you just a brief little video. And it is an old example, <laughs> as you will see. <laughs> But it's a really solid example, so if you can get past the way it looks. Um, because this is one session, and it documents the, the progress. You can see that the stroke patient made within one session. You, you'll see the PT walking first and doing the assessment, because this was done in co-treatment with PT and music therapy. And then you'll see the music therapist walking backwards, cueing the steps. So watch for that. And then you'll see... Later, um, that patient is again working with the music therapist, and the patient progresses from a walker to a cane. So, just watch this example. We have a music therapist <coughs> in the facility at Puerto Valley Hospital on the rehabilitation team. And the music therapist, in co oping with other therapists, can add music, live music, to the training sessions. That has the advantage of being very adaptive in terms of speed, in terms of style, in terms of how the patient needs. 
And of course, we do see a therapeutic value in the musical interaction between the music therapist and the patient. You know. So in that really short example, there's a lot going on, but you can see how the assessment was done, no music, and then you can see how the music was added to match the gait and then progress to without the walker to just the cane. Um, there's been, there was one study that was done with um, hemiparetic stroke victims, and the patients who participated in RAS showed statistically significant improvements in not only their um, stride symmetry, but the weight-bearing um, amount on the paretic leg, as well as their knee angle control. So just one example of how we can do rhythmic auditory stimulation. Okay, so this study um, actually shows um, the effects of RAS long term. Um, what they, you can see there's, uh, at the bottom there is the pretest uh, velocity measurements for um, some patients, 22 patients with uh, Parkinson's disease. And they did, I believe, three weeks of uh, RAS training. It was a take home, um, a take home program. So they each got headphones and they walked. Um, to the, the designated speed, and they would come in and, and re, get reevaluated and increase the speed as necessary as they were improving their gait. And you can see um, their velocity really improved over the treatment periods of the post test, is that second number there. And then after that post test, they didn't do any more treatment, they just had them come back in and be reevaluated. And you can see the effects lasted for us, and it was once a week. So they lasted about three weeks with no further treatment um, with, with those patients. And, and you can see with Parkinson's disease, that's a debilitating disease. You would expect to see more of a gradual decline there, as, as happened in the fourth week there. So the hypothesis there is that if you continue uh, with music therapy training, how long would they be able to maintain their mobility? It's kind of unknown, but perhaps quite a while. And here also, um, PSC, pattern sensory enhancement, is a, a technique that we utilize um, when we're working with uh, other um, lots of other mobility issues. Um, this particular study is very simple and was just working on uh, arm rehabilitation and stretching. So essentially what's happening here, the first baseline, there's a, uh, there's a little camera attached to the wrist of the patient here, patients, and uh, they're tapping, t tap once, tap twice, and then up a little bit on a little bit of a ramp. You can see there's a lot of wrist uh, wiggle in the paretic arm there, and with the no rhythm, there's uh, even more. And then in the rhythm, you can see how the trajectory just immediately smooths out as soon as you add that rhythm piece in there. The last sensory motor example that we're going to talk about is TIMP. Um, and essentially, this is a combination of RAS and PSC, but it's the specific placement of um, an instrument working on cueing functional movements. So, um, to give you a quick example, the goal is never obviously to make music, but what is the functional movement? I'll stand. Yeah. So I'm going to have Jenny stand, and we're actually going to just for time. This is something that I oftentimes do with patients who are um, working on range of motion, um, but what you're going to see with her, it's more core strength, endurance, and then um, some stretching. But so. I think pediatric patient maybe has received chemo, um, has some deficits from that, and just to give you an example, it's not, go ahead, play. The goal isn't to just have her play, but when we get range of motion, sometimes we need to do this in co-treatment with PT first, sometimes we can do it on our own, event, but you kind of get the picture. So to just give you an example, a lot of times um, when the teams will come in, they're like, Oh, what are you doing? Well, then it gives me a great example, you know, a great opportunity to say, oh, well, you know what, we're not just playing, we're actually working on something. But if it looks like play to the kids, then that increases their compliance. Um, a lot of times, um, if you ask any of the PTs that I work with, they're often requesting co treatment because the patients will be so much more compliant and they'll work harder and longer. And not only are the patients enjoying it, the family tends to enjoy it, the nursing staff doesn't need as much of a battle to repeat it because then we can give them examples of, hey, let's leave the drum in the room, quick show them something you can do with them, so then repeating that exercise isn't so tedious. But there are four advantages to TIMP here. It's the activation or priming the motor system. The instruments 
with proper force trajectory. Um, again, what movement are we looking to get? And then the auditory feedback, there's that benefit as well as essentially the entrainment factor. We want to give you just a couple examples too um, from the cognitive areas where we would work from. Um, music neglect training, attention and <coughs> perception. Um, thinking about a patient that has maybe left neglect uh, from a brain injury, again, thinking about how would you place the instrument starting with, you know, right hand in front of them and then increasing that awareness moving to the left. I was just doing that this week with a patient because we couldn't get the patient without the instrument to become aware of what's over here. The therapist would be in charge of this, obviously. <laughs> so, again, a simple example about why are we using the music and, and how are we doing it. Or... An example for music sensory orientation training, um, providing, you know, there's all this sensory feedback that comes from the guitar. If you um, place the guitar on the bed, there's feedback that will come through the mattress. So there was a teen patient who um, was in the PEDS ICU and had lots of underlying conditions, but essentially she was in for her seizures, and we had her in a medically induced coma. We lightened the sedation, and she was not, she was not arousing. So her parents had requested that I come to meet her because I had worked with her before. And I started with the guitar just playing in the room, and there was no response. So then I placed the guitar on the bed so she could maybe get that sensory stimulation through the bed. Again, no response. So then my third thing, I said, well, I'm going to place your hand on the guitar. So I placed her hand on the guitar so she could feel it. And then there was a response. She opened her eyes for the first time. And within the 45-minute session, she went from opening her eyes to vocalizing and verbalizing with me in the session. So her nurse was obviously excited, as well as her parents, and it was a PICU consultant who I didn't think really grasped what music therapy was or the value, and now I can say that that person is a huge advocate because they paid the consultant to come see. You can believe it. So a simple example, but um, why are we doing what we're doing? There's always a reason. Um, before we move off of um, cognitive training, I just wanted to talk about a couple of things. Um, when we're talking about memory training, um, we can move obviously beyond the, the ABCs. And I've actually taught um, some people their address using uh, specific songs about that. Um, what you like, what I like to do is uh, I'll match the prosody of the just this way to speak, the way you speak your address. I'll match that to. Um, a melody and then that's more easily um, essentially you can kind of erase the melody just sounds like you're speaking it that way um, and also uh, we will often work on executive function training any frontal lobe damage uh, we can work on you know just something as simple as a songwriting exercise you can make lots of lots and lots of decisions so we can work on decision making organization um, all planning following through on your plan lots and lots of various um, uh, functional outcomes for that. We, we have fun example for you, but we got to get going here. <laughs> so if you have time, you can stick around. We'll do it at the end. Um, okay. Are you on this one? Sure. Uh, so speech and language training. Um, many of you might remember within the last year when Representative Gabby Giffords was shot and had her injury. Um, when she was receiving her rehab at Tier, she was getting neurologic music therapy. Her music therapist was trained in neurologic music therapy, and I don't know if you saw some of the videos, but one of the first times that she sang, or actually spoke, was through song. It was Happy Birthday. And then I saw another video of her in co-treatment with um, the NMT and their speech therapist um, working on essentially music speech stimulation. Take the song. Um, this was the song they were working on. Girls just want to have fun. Okay, so that's what they were using to cue some initial expression of speech, and then they would move to more functional things. But just to get that um, expressed. Go ahead. I think about um, working with patients who have had referrals, a um, couple of patients who have come in for a childhood apraxia of speech. I get referrals to see then outpatient through Ronald McDonald House. Um, working and communicating with the speech language pathologist, they're getting seen downtown, they're part of a study, it's a very strict regimen, but how are we partnering together to work on those goals? So communicating like that, um, another example of how we work together. 
Um, I think we're just going to skip a lot of that and just kind of summarize things for right. you. If you have any questions about specific techniques, don't hesitate to ask them when you have time for questions, but we want to make sure we leave some time for that. Um, so just to summarize here a little bit, why do we use, utilize neurologic music therapy? Because it provides opportunities to retrain the brain and adapt, rehabilitate, develop skills for improved thinking, moving, speaking, emotional. Essentially, we're working on the, the whole body. Any, any kind of brain functioning you need to work on, we can do it. Um, evidence also shows that neurologic music therapy can, now this is key, can produce faster, more long-lasting improvements than some faint, same functional exercises performed without music. And again, just talking about how neurologic music therapy can be easily incorporated into the inpatient setting, into the outpatient setting, in private practice settings, um, all ages, birth through the elderly, and um, in multiple different rehabilitation purposes and goals. Um, and NMT -er is meant to support and enhance those functional therapeutic exercises, and obviously it can increase patient motivation and their compliance with treatment plans, which we talked about. But I also think that there's um, a little bit of a side benefit for staff. I don't know if we've ever looked at that, um, but how does it increase staff morale or their thought of working with patients, difficult patients? Your conference is scheduled to end in two minutes. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Voice from above. <laughs> and that, you know, neurologic music therapy isn't meant to replace any therapies that we're already offering, but it's meant to enhance and support and, again, work on that teamwork aspect and meeting the goals of the patients and helping that happen, meet those functional goals a little bit faster and in increasing the patient satisfaction level as well as the parents and the caregivers that we're working with. So do you guys have any questions?